Hello. So I got a lot of question asking whether there is room in the course or not. There is. I am accepting more students. So so far, I have seen backpack has got one forty six subscriptions. Right. So if that's the number of students are going to be there, I'm okay with it. Right. So if you know anyone who still is looking for this course, you can ask that student to to take this course or register for this course. Right. So I'm not going to as of now drop anybody. If you can register for course. I'm going to go to. I want to see how many students uh, are registering. Of course, there is a physical limit of I think one six seventy or so. We can't be more than that in this class. We can't have can't have more than that. But one forty six is fine. Okay. Another thing for those of you who are new, uh, whatever documents that I will share on Google Docs. You can access them if you are using the Triple ID email address. If you are using the your standard Gmail address, then it will you will not have permission. So if you want to access those documents or you go on backpack, even if it allows you to use your email address, please register with your Triple ID email address so that I can map you to the right roll number. Otherwise, I don't have that control. Okay, so use a Triple ID official email address. For registering and accessing all the resources. So I saw some of you did go to Socrate for feedback, and I got that feedback. It was helpful for us, so I know now that system is working. So at the end of this lecture today, I we have posted three questions, and I want you to answer it within the class right here in front of you. So I will allot it some time at the end. And you can look at those questions. Those of you who have laptops can open up, go to the website, and uh, answer the questions. If you already installed a Socrative app on your smartphone, then you can go to that, write down the room number, and you will see these three questions. Very easy three questions, and it, you can submit your answer. Right? It, it depends on what I taught today. Right? So if you listen to what I'm saying today, you should be able to answer these questions. Um, regarding the projects, I got lots of questions. Is that also what will be project and so? So right now, don't think about what is possible and what's not possible. Think more about what do you want to do with the mobile phone, right? And then think of a vision. I understand right now you don't know. Maybe some of you don't know Android. I will teach you about Android, basics of Android, and guide you through. Various things that are important for you to develop a good Android application. Right. So don't worry about that. You don't know mobile computing or mobile programming as of now. But think of the projects. Don't come right now to me and ask ideas. I will give you ideas anyway when the time comes. Right now, if you have an idea, I will be more interested in listening to that idea rather than me giving you some idea right now. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? So today I will start with the start of mobile computing. I think it's very good to start or begin with the beginning. So this is a paper. This is a seminal paper. What we say in the research world. And this actually laid down the whole road about what we want to achieve in the future in terms of computing. So you say the cycle is still following the computer for the 21st century, and this is and mobile is a big part of this computer. There are other things also, but mobile is one of the biggest part of it. The reason, so I will be talking a little philosophical today, and then I will get technical. So philosophy because you should know what what we are learning for. A lot of times you read the textbook, you go through the exam, you submit some assignment, and at the end you don't really know what you learn. Right, so the, the, the topic of today's or the objective of today's lecture is to give you underlying theme about why you should learn this. Right, so that everybody gets. I hope everybody gets enthusiasm, excited about this topic, and then we proceed with it. So this is a person, Mark Weiser. He was at Xerox Research in Park. Park is near Palo Alto. It's at Palo Alto in California. Right, this is 99. This is when I graduated with B.Tech. Right? That 
that's when he talked about what into the computing and trust me today whatever you see or whatever we are seeing is exactly what he predicted at that time in 2014 so i think it's been 15 years now okay so let me just start with it rather than talking much about it so a lot of things that we learn and when we learn it sufficiently well when we really understand it it goes inside us then it becomes part of our dna right we use the term it it has now become part of my dna what it exactly means is if you cease to be aware of it for example you know walking so well you don't really think about walking right now right when you walk you just walk you don't think about okay i have to take this step and then right and then left and my balance and all of that right it's just taken care of your brain also is not engaged in any of these activities other good example of this is the street sign right we so we look at the street sign and immediately we know what to do or what it means you don't have to recollect okay these are the signs and this is the fifth sign so it should be there so you don't need a manual with you and just go to the manual and find out what it means like it becomes part of your nature another term for this thing is called we have compiled that information in philosophy and psychology there are various terms static dimension visually invariant so you right we don't it doesn't vary visually for you it's the whole idea it's always there we don't know this our own idea very to hand very to be just all of that that different terms for the same meaning so whenever we want to introduce any new technology the whole purpose of the technology is to achieve this So if I develop a new, new research thing, anything as a new technology, I should have this goal, and I think you should also. If you are developing your product, and once you become, once you graduate with your engineering degree, you go out, you develop your product. Your product should be something like this. Right? The people are using it, but they are not even noticing that it's there, and it becomes part of your niche. How to achieve this? There are different ways of doing it, but we will now see technically what you should do so that. is a given right so the good thing about this is we are free to use them without thinking and so to focus beyond them on our goals so one of the reasons we had for the backpack is it should just vanish in the lives of instructor and the student we should not be thinking all the time about backpack right i want to be this course what should i do to go and make it available on the backpack it should be so easily usable that i don't know this right so that's what our goal was so the back and we are trying to do that so how is it different from what we have today right this person really says stuff right i i have more pictures with actually people cursing the laptop and the desktop right but i didn't want to show all that right? i just think one of the better ones And you're sitting in, in front of your desktop. We're just continuously staring at it. So that means it's not really vanishing, right? You are noticing it. You are stuck to that chair, and you're continuously looking at that screen, which is throwing some light on you, right? So even the most powerful notebook that you get, so with all the access to all the wild web, all the internet, and all this thing that it comes up with, right? You still want the end of the day. What you're doing is you're focusing your attention on a single box. Right? This is not called an easy box, but this is a smart box. But it's still a box, right? So one point of this bullet is, no matter how processing, how much processing it has got, how much memory it has got, how fast it is, how connected it is, still you cannot achieve the disappearance. It's not disappearing for me. It's there in your life. You always carry it around, right? And then you keep it, and then you open it, and you keep staring at it. Okay? I really don't want this. Okay, then what are the alternatives in technology for this? One thing is virtual reality. Right? So this is where the artificial, artificial intelligence or machine learning plays big role, and they started a new field now, which which is a virtual reality. Right? If you see this, this is the kind of virtual reality we have. Now, what is the difference between this and this, or is there a difference between these? Okay. 
Okay. So, but okay, let, let me say what one out of the clarity. The difference is one thing is she's wearing, one thing is sitting in front. I'm not so sure about whether she can maybe once she's wearing for some time she will not be alive. Okay, but what are the similarities between these? She's happy, okay? Yes, that's very good. Right. So one key similarity in both of these is one is sitting about two feet from you and one is sitting in front of you. So by the way, Google Glass also falls in this. Right? In a lot of math. Not exactly, but in a lot of times Google Glass also comes in this category. But the thing is, you see it's not disappeared, right? You have to take that Google Glass and keep wearing it. And people will start noticing you, and you are also looking at there what it is showing always, right? So it, it means it's not fully disappeared. So what is virtual reality? Virtual reality is to make a world inside the computer. You have a digital world. Your Facebook is your digital world. You have friends there. You have relatives there. You have co-workers there. Everybody is there, but it's not reality. At the end of the day, it is making a reality. You take something from the real world, you fit it there, and you stay there in that world. It's not reality. Right? So this is a world inside computer and www, the internet. Right? So this is, that's why it becomes virtual. And it focuses enormous operators on simulating things in the real world on inside the digital world. So for example, you have lots of games. Right, the farm mill and similar games, which otherwise in reality you will do. Right, you will raise animals, but then you do the same thing in in this world, which is the virtual reality. Okay, so is it disappearing? Do you think Facebook is disappearing, or do you constantly think of Facebook? What is more correct? You it's there in your mind. There is Facebook, and there are these friends, and they are and how they are connected. And this is what somebody has said, and this is what somebody has replied, right? And it's there. And then when you see your friend, you may not even talk about that. Right? But when you go in your friend, you will type something and then again come back in reality and talk something totally different. Right? So actually in your brain, you are living two different worlds. One is this one, one is the other one. So I did not say that Facebook has achieved this. Like the one that I has showed you before. Yes. Right. It's not a street sign, it's not like easy as walking, but you have to learn. That's why your grandparents can't very easily go to Facebook. Right? Imagine Facebook, doing Facebook or social networking is as easy as walk. They could have done it, but they can't do it. So it's not there. It's a good product, but it's not the ideal. So do you know of any examples where things, so walking was one example, it came natural to us. But something that humans build and it has vanished, other than the sheet set. What for? Eyeglasses, yes. Eyeglasses is. There is still, we have to remember it, but yeah, it has disappeared. What is another next step? More complicated, maybe. Machinery. Variables are disappearing, like the watch. Right. But it also has another function and that's why it's easy for it to disappear. Okay, what else? What else? Something which is complex. How many of you drive? How many of you know drive? Okay. If you suddenly if you are if sleeping and suddenly somebody wakes you up and say, Okay, I have to go to let's say hospital and you drive. Within two minutes, right? Do you usually notice that you're driving? Right? You, you just your feet know what to do, your hands know what to do, all the indicators, everything that you know which mirror to look at. It's a complex thing, right? And not only it is complex there for you, it, it looks something like this inside, right? How many of you can find out where is the motor and where is that cable going and what it is doing? You have some of you, but not everyone of you. Right? And if my grandfather knows driving, he certainly doesn't know any of these. Even in the latest car, what it says. Right? So this is an example of technology.
technology, I would say, which, is, which has been successful in getting this. Area. It's complex. Nowadays, there are microcontrollers there. There are actual real computers sitting inside the car. Right? If you go to the latest automobile garage, right, they will connect the cables and they have a computer which senses everything and gives you a report. What is wrong or what is good with your car? So it has got its own computer, but it is so successful in getting this IP that you don't have to know what's inside. It's easy to use with just a couple of inputs. Right? So this is a very good example of technology getting this IP. So you see, if you pay careful attention, the driver might be able to listen to them, but right, they, there's no point in even knowing about it. And so anybody, a person who is not even educated, can drive a car. It's that easy. Maybe it's not true for the face. Another example is this is a thermostat. It's a company called Mest. It's now acquired by Google. Right? In a lot of places, you can control the temperature and humidity inside a room, even light nowadays. So these things are so complex. It's like if you see the audio mix, the audio mixer in a studio, right? You have to know lots of frequencies. You have to make the lots up and down. It's a complex thing. But now if you see it, it has become something simple as just dialing it, it's rotating it. And it can adjust to which people are there in the room, what is the condition of the room, lights and everything. It can find out and it can adjust everything. And optimize it for you, right? So this is something people who were working in Apple, they started a company and now it's acquired by Google because Google wants to get into this field of controlling the temperature. So one thing that we want to know is you should have a image. This is connected to the internet. Now the cars will also get connected to the internet and a lot of things will form in the connection, not only the network but the computer part. So now I'm going to make a very important point as to what enables things to get disappeared. Right? And this is something you can keep with you forever. If you want to develop any new technology, just remember and see whether you are taken care of these two things. And if these things are done, then pretty much you are on the right track. Yes. Right, so see if you take this example of thermostat, right, it, it is one control from which you are controlling a lot of things. Even in your car, your steering wheel is not independent. It is con connected to a lot of other things directly or indirectly. So for anything that wants to get, like if you have lots of tools and parts and machines and components, right, and you want them to disappear, they want Thing that's required is it should get connected. The network comes should be there. I will explain this point later in more detail, but right now if you see this is connected across. This is also connected, right? Either to wireless or wire. Lots of connections are there which get disappear finally, but they are there. Even in your electricity, right? Everything is connected. Okay, now coming to the two important things for you, and he mentioned it. And that is what everybody as a researcher is following. We mentioned two things. One thing is you need to know location. And second thing he said, you need to be scalable or you need to understand what is the scale at which you're working. So location means if I have right now I'm standing here, this is C01 interpolated in Oklahoma City, like I should know where I am. And everybody else should know where I am. And scale means if I want to, for example, the 22 motor that I showed you in a car. Right? You should be able to scale up. The thermostat should be able to scale up everything inside your house. Right? You cannot say that I can only talk to one, one, one machine at a time. Right? It should be able to scale up. And in 1999, when he says today, he is referring to 1999, computers don't have an idea about their location. Right? So in 1999, if you see all the desktops, all the big mainframes and machines, nobody has a clue where it is located. Forget about globally, even in campus, the device did not know where it is. And nowadays, every device knows where it is. If you take out your smartphone, it knows exactly where it is. Right? 
second thing about the key on your mobile phone that it has now excluded and it has become so cheap it's not dirt cheap yet but it's cheap enough for us so every person can carry one phone right? so the two things which mobile companies and researchers did is right, they started making location that's why the gps the gps first of all was only used by military nobody was interested in gps other than military right but then for this technology to succeed smartphones mobile right first thing they used is location they put the gps in it not the location and then they made the cost and the size so small right so everybody starts affording it and then they could get a lot of data so scale and location at that time in 99 no problem so the computer merely knows what room it is in it can adapt its behavior significantly without ai you don't need a very complex technology like ai artificial intelligence in a computer just tell him where it is right and tell him that there are lots of these computers like this everywhere and it will then function as if there is ai artificial intelligence behind it so can you tell me what would be your vision if a computer knows where it is right? and a lot of computers how can it adapt to you you walk in inside your home what will happen maybe one of you did. this is more on meditation this is i'm not taking some and expecting also anything from technical side but what would you achieve if you have this knowledge right Right. Or what about your office phone? If they tell you what you miss, what did you miss when you were not at home? Like the moment you walked in with your computer there. Yeah.
you will get hit. Like you can't imagine that having so many tablets with you. Right? So just how many of you imagine that there will be continuous running of 220 volts around you? Right? If you talk to everybody maybe 200 years ago, and then there will constantly be 220 volts around you all the time running. And some of it with high amperes, they will get scared. Right? Because they know electricity is dangerous. It could be dangerous. Today it is all there in the disappear. So tomorrow we will have all of these in our rooms and we will not notice them. Okay. So how do we use them? So what he did, he did an experiment. He, he actually developed something called an active batch. Right? Which is a very small it's more like a clip on computer, roughly of a size of an ID card, which is a very small, it's like a smartphone. And these badges can identify themselves to the receiver space throughout the building, making it possible for them to track people. So now what we're doing is I'm carrying an ID badge, and wherever I go, the computer on it knows where I am all the time. Actually, if I walk inside the room, it can tell the room that I am inside because every badge will identify that employee uniquely. And then the room can adapt to the needs of that person. So I don't need to have a specific office. I can walk inside any room and make that thing as my office for that day. But everything in that room will adapt to my needs. Right? The printer will open my commands. My phone calls will get routed to that machine inside that handset. Right? My emails will come there. Everything will be there. Right? So I don't need to go and search for a room or have a specific room. Wherever I go, it's my office. Another device he has in those days is called PDA, Personal Digital Assistant. And it's a small display that can serve simultaneously like an active batch, and it can also carry a calendar and a line. So he started with a PDA. Right? It's just very, nowadays, it, it has become like a smartphone. Right? So it's also merging. The devices are merging. Right? And this, is, this becomes extension to computer screen. Right? So this is our small device, the smallest one. The next one is PAD, or what we today call it is, actually we also call it iPad, like we just put an idea. Right, so this is the iPad. Right, so, I, so this is actually going live also. Right, so I, sometimes I say things, right, and this is public. Right? So how do I say this? <laughs> so by the way, you must be in the relationship between Apple and Xerox. Right. I try to go more than that, but if you don't know, read about it. Right? What is the relationship between Apple and Xerox research? Okay. And now let's come back. It's this back. Right? So he said you will have about two microprocessors on that, and which is the case right now. We have about dual core machines. It's basically a display which can show you one A4 size paper. Right? And what he said, it's a scratch computer. I think it's not something which you cling on to and carry everywhere. You will have about tens of these in every room, just like you have sheets of paper. Right? You scribble something on the paper, you don't care about it. You just keep it there or you carry it somewhere. Right? It's something similar. You will have lots of these pads and these are scratch computers. That means you don't have to worry about carrying it off everywhere else. Right? So he says a pad that must be carried from a place to place is a failure. If you come up with the technology and I have to carry it with me and you call it a pad, it's a failure. You should strive for something more than that. And we are going in that direction. It's exactly opposite to what Windows is what Windows was. He said it is antidote to Windows. And Windows means you see you see Windows logo and you keep doing something, right? And then you pop off with your laptop somewhere else. So it's not Windows. And spread many pads around on a desk. Just like you have lots of paper on your desk, you have lots of pads. Okay? So that's our second class of device. A pad. The last one is the display, which we see nowadays a lot of times HD display. It will be a video screen, a bulletin board, or a whiteboard size, right? It, be big. it has to be big. It can't be small like a laptop screen. Right? And it should, or in this place, I think this is where only where we have exceeded demand. What he speculated was 1024 by 768 black and white pixels. But as you know, today we are far better than this. 
we can do very high resolution, more than 1440, and we can go up to how many colors? Maybe we see the latest stack. 4K. Right? If you see the latest stack, the most expensive TV will say 4K. It can show you 4K of colors, 4000. Right? A lot of them. It uses in He developed one and he used wireless electronic talk to communicate with this. So, by the way, he's not just talking theory. He actually developed all of these and showcased it. We did an experiment where people will remotely collaborate with the whole picture in 99. So, I am sitting here, somebody else is sitting in totally a remote part of the world, and we can collaborate jointly and draw a picture on this. So, for example, here I can teach, and somebody also can participate in teaching from somewhere. Else. Right? Some, something is possible right now with Google Hangout, right? Actually, people can listen to me and they can even ask questions. Right now, I'm not taking questions here, but it's possible. We can jointly do something remotely also. So, the challenge what he mentioned in those days was it must be viewable from a distance. That means it has to be higher reach. It should be better than this one, in fact. And it should trans that means it should transfer about 80 pixels per inch. And we are better than this even on the phone now. We have retina displays. A very nice display where you can punch in a lot of things in a very small area. So there are two things that make your phone very hot or very your battery. What are those two things? Can you raise your hand and see? Display, yeah. Display has to become number one and the network. Right? So initially it was network and then the display, but with today's HD display, it's so many colors and brightness that it consumes more power than your network. Network has now gone to the number two. But still, these are the two things you have to worry about when you like your code, display, and network. Okay, so he said, okay, state of the art, what did he have at that time? So he said, I have current implementations of distributed computing. This is, by the way, a course in itself. We also have it here, distributed computing. That can make network file systems filter except that disappear as if they are connected to each computer. And if I can take my laptop anywhere inside this campus, and if I want to print it, it gets printed in on the printer which is next to me, and not in my office, which is in P301. Right? I think we don't have it right now. We have the protocols to do it, but as of now, we can't really do it very easily. I should go and see what printers are there. I should know their IP addresses. I can store every printer with its IP address. And then when I'm in the room, I search for that printer's IP address. It's usually written on somewhere. And then I say, okay, select this printer and then print. Okay, so it's so time consuming. Ideal thing should be I just say print. Then my laptop should know where I am. It should know where which printer is in that room. It should contact that printer and get it printed there. Usually. Right? So that's the AI part. It's not there yet, but we can do it. We have protocols for that. Another thing he said is our operating systems are not geared, geared for this. In those days, it was DOS and Unix in 99. MS DOS and the standard Unix. Right? You see, they by default assume that your machine hardware will never change. And they will not be moved from one room to another. Right? And that's how their configuration is. But if I want to use it in today's world, they will actually move from one room to another room and they will talk to other devices which I can't even right, expect what it could be. Right? For example, you connect your USB and then you have to, like, in a nice manner, Eject that USB. Right? So it becomes complex for you because you have to remember that you have a USB injected. Right? But ideally, what should happen is you can do all of these things without even remembering which device gets connected and they get immediately. Right? So your OS has to be redesigned. And the technology for this is microkernel. Anybody knows what microkernel is in OS? You take the OS class, right? See? Yes. Right. Right. So how much time does it really take for a uh, Linux server to boot? Has anybody seen? 
how many seconds? Four to five seconds. Okay. Sort of over the rhythm. It takes a long time. Right? It takes a minute. Right? It, and because Linux has something called monolithic kernels. Right? Even today, your Windows has monolithic kernel. Right? I always sorry, not I. Mac OS does not have a monolithic kernel. It's a little different. It's on the lines of microkernel. Right? But most of the traditional operating systems they have monolithic kernel. They take a long time to boot because the kernel has to fire up everything. And it takes it has to load all sorts of drivers, start servers, everything in the background, and then it shows your first kit. Right? These days it will be faster as you say four five seconds. Because the processor is fast, but still the kernel is the same. What he's saying is we should have a microkernel. I, I I cannot take few minutes to reboot my devices, which are has like hundreds or two hundreds of them. Imagine I have to wait till hundreds of these devices take time to boot up, and I just sit in my room. Right? So we need to have better operating systems so that it takes very less time to boot and. I can connect and disconnect from the network and devices in a fast manner. Right. So this is X Windows, which is part of Unix, and 3.0 Windows, which is coming from Microsoft. Do not work well with these applications, which move from screen to screen. Even in today's world, we don't have base. If I want to migrate from, I'm working on my laptop. In the word document open, I just can't close it and immediately look at my tablet and it is there. In the same way, I left on my laptop. Not in there. We are going there, and we have to share it through some Dropbox, right, and like sync it up and all that, and then we can go there. But what they want is, I close this, I look at my phone, and it should be there as it is, where I left it out. Okay. So operating should be smart enough to move your work from one device to another device very seamlessly. And as fast as you move, the work should also move at the same speed. Right. So this is not there. X Windows is something which takes care of the screen. Right. It's standard thing in Linux and Unix. But even today we don't have this. And very important, and this is very important even for our course, is wireless network. You will not have cables on any of these devices. If you start putting cables in there, you can't have these cables. Right. So they start with the basic functionality of wireless. And with this unique suite of MVPs, with your HD videos and so on from one to the other device. And you want to transfer your entire work from one device to another device, you better need MVPs bandwidth on all of these parts. And that's why we have Wi Fi HD, right, which is going in that direction. So it should support about 100 devices in a room. Do you know how many? Laptops can be supported over Wi Fi in this room. Any guess? 60? Yeah, you're right. It's less than 60. Although we have so many seats, every one of you open up your laptop right, and start looking at applications of Wi Fi cache. It's because by the Wi Fi device, even the, the state of the art, right, it can take about 30 or so clients. More than that, right, it should just goes down. And the TCP IP, the way it works, if you see congestion in the network traffic, right, it will go into a mode where it cannot even deliver anything. Right? So, because of that, so we have put about two access points. Now, there is one there, there is another one there. And I guess there is, if there is more than this, it's about 60. Right, so that's how we go there, 60. Okay, so we need very good wireless networks, right? And one should pop on about short range, long range, and high capacity. Short range means something which is very close, like NFC, near field communication. Right? Something which is long range, like Wi Fi. And something which can transfer a lot, it should be high capacity option. Right? So this is what is required. So for the scale part, two things. One thing is the size should fit all of this. The cost, economics of it should also fit all of this, and they should be able to get this cost. So that's how I define scale. So scale and location. 
location because then you can adapt the capability of device to where it is and serve the user in a better way. Scale of it is because then you can have that many of these and then you can don't have to carry. I will show you one what's the problem with carrying always everybody, everything everywhere. Right? But you don't want to carry them always everywhere. And you shouldn't worry about their configuration. The other thing which is really minor than scale and location is the network. It should have very good network capability, both near field or short range and long range with high capacity. Then it should be able to move its display from one to another in a seamless manner. It should boot very fast. Right? It should upgrade itself also very fast. So if I have a new software patch for all of these devices, I don't have to wait for a long time to upgrade. It should immediately do that. And it should get connected, disconnected very easily. Right? So this is we should try to achieve. So this is a bit of short class because I want to give that to you after this. Okay, so what is the bright future? Right? If you want to now envision, the paper is online, it's in there in the backpack, and we put my slides also very soon. If you see today, people are holding up in small windows in office. You know, window as an IT real window, not window as a Microsoft window. Right? Before blowing computer screen, you're constantly looking at the screen. You're carrying it on your laps, on your desk, on your table, in the metro, in the buses. Everywhere you see the same person typing, typing, typing. Right? This is not the vision we had when we started with computers. Right? This will make individuals more aware of the people on the other side of the computer screen. Right? If the computer should vanish, then only you can see what the other person is. And we are now very hold up in the information that gets presented to you rather than the source of the information. Right? And more importantly, what today's world is getting into is something called information world. And by the way, I also talk to the doctors at end. And they are also aware of these things. It's not that they are not aware, but they can't take it out immediately and they don't even have a solution for it. Right? There are lots of problems with this. One thing is information over. We get just too much of information in a day. We don't even require all of that information. Most of the information is we can just throw away. But because of the screen and the way we work, it gets there to us. And you get burdened or we get burdened as a person. So very nice sentence. It's actually, there is a lot more information available in the nature. You can't even imagine. This is the world we created as humans. Like WWW we created. Facebook we created. Right? What is already there, the nature, for example, in the woods, if you're taking a walk in the woods, it has got so much information. Right? The trees, the plants, the air, the physics, the biology, the chemistry, everything is there. Right? But you never get overlooking. Right? You get relaxed. You feel relaxed. Because it's not telling you all the time. Oh, you have this message, you have this notification, you have this deadline, and you have this, that, this, that, right? There's no marketing thing, there's no sales speech, there's nothing. Right? You are on your own, right? And it's there. But it doesn't, it's not thrown on your face. What is today is happening is it's just thrown on your face. Right? So this is the picture. Right? It's so relaxing. Right? It's not, the information is there by the way. Right? It's a lot of information. You can't even imagine how much information is there. But it's not there. So let me show you a small video.
So this is way better than the Google Glass, right? You know? I'm saying it online, right? But still, I think this is better than Google Glass, right? Constantly bearing something in front of you. This is possible. Right. So you see, there are lots of things which are very much possible. I'm not showing you something which is impossible. You see, this is way different than what we have. Right. What we imagine, what we want to be is this. Not sitting in front of computers, and this mobile is, as I think, showing you examples, will allow you to achieve this. Right? So, what I want you to do now is, both of you have laptops, can open up the laptops and look at it. And there is a quiz on software, and it is in progress. So, there are three questions. You fill in the room number as CAC535. Monsoon 2014. As a student, I do understand the noise. You should put this name as a room number or room name, and you will be shown three questions. Answer these three questions, and then you can go out. Yeah, if you search for operating laptop. So I think that even this works. B.operating.com, right? If you go to this and the left page, and then there are two logins, student login and teacher login, right? So student login, right? And you put this as the room number, a room name, and then you see the questions, right? You have to write down your name, last name, or first name, right? And then after that, you will be shown three questions, you submit them, which is like the right answer. I think the first question is objective, which is like one of these two. Second and the third question is subjective. You have to write the sentence, right? And then after that, you submit and it will also take, give you a feedback instantly. And once you're done, yeah, you can go. But I want you to fill in this so that I get an idea how much you got. So then next time I can prepare myself accordingly. Yes. Any questions? Is it there? Anybody is able to look at it? Yeah. Yes. Today. Okay. Yeah. I don't know, maybe you can do it again if you think that your answer should be different. You can try it. 